All right, we're back in the navigation. How to use this Matthew 24 for navigation, but also to see what it, the outline of what is really being said here in scripture. Because when you read these words in English, it's like, and Jesus exited the temple and everybody wanted to know the signs of his coming. And we're all too familiar with the English. Not only that, but we're missing a lot of the specificity that's being provided in the Greek, especially with the meter. Now I want to show you another function of the meter because this whole playlist is designed to show meter methodology in case I croak or I go blind because I'm my eyes are starting to go. Um, but I can just get cataract surgery and if it works I'll be fine. But you know, in the meantime, if something bad happens, I'm the only one on earth right now who gets this. So I need to document how to do it so you can test it yourself because it's in the scripture. You don't have to be a scholar to count syllables, all right? And you also don't have to be a scholar to understand the Greek words because they're just words. You learn an English word, you use a French word. When we say Jehovah, that's actually German. We're pronouncing it in American English, but it's a German word. A lot of our words are not English words. They're called loan words. All right, so just learn some new words. And you learn a word one at a time, Yeru. That means temple. Okay, now you just learned a new word. Learn one or two or five words a day. And by the end of the year, you'll know 1,500 words, which is most of the language that people daily use. Okay, that's how pastors learn in seminary. Okay, so it's no big deal. But, like chess, it's the rules are fairly few. The words are fairly few. And once you learn them, well, you'll spend a lifetime analyzing them. Well, now let's do some analysis the way the Bible is written. See, the idea of studying Bible is to learn what God says. Not what we want Him to say. Not what we think He says. Not what dear Dr. So-and-so claims. Even if Dr. So-and-so is right, his knowledge is not your knowledge, so you're not really learning anything until you know why he knows what he knows. Okay, well, here we go. Right up here at the top. Right up here at the top. Intra document links. Alright? This helps you move around. That takes you to verse 2. And then this takes you to verse 4. And then this takes you to the note for Horao, which means to see. And this takes you back to where you were. Alright? That's the navigation. Pretty simple. But when you add up how these words all work together, you actually get a summary just by the way the words occur. Now, apocrites means ruling. Amen means judgment. Believe it when I tell you. And then it, the, the, what follows is some kind of judgment and it involves religious war every single time. And the next, the, the next one in alphabetical order is C. Look at. Pay attention. And then the next one, Samayan, sign. That's something you see. Okay? The next word, Christos, Jesus. Actually, Jesus occurs first. But Christos, Jesus stresses his office. Okay? It's also first in alphabetical order. Jesus. Next word, Parousia, or Parousia. Means appearing. It's a... It's a uh, sort of cultural word for second coming. Alright. Kurias, Lord. It's pronounced as two syllables here in Matthew. Three syllables elsewhere in scripture. Next word, Numphias, bridegroom. Next word, Basileus, king. Now, think about those words for a minute. I gotta go get some. They're occurring here in alphabetical order, not in verse order. So now we're going to go to notes. And here I've listed them instead in verse order. In verse order. 
there's 70 occurrences 70 is the number for voting in the Bible it's established in um, by Moses in Psalm 90 um, I think it's verse 10 where he says a lifetime is man is 70 years or if he's having a really healthy life it's 80 so you're voting for your lifetime okay the actual structure of time is based on 70s 490 plus 70 plus 490 which is right here explaining the purpose of the meter for its time usage that's not the only usage the meter has but that's the the usage we're looking at here this is how some I um, mean Matthew 24 25 is constructed it is a timed statement of history one syllable per year that goes from 30 AD when Christ speaks it to 32:43 AD which is a play on the Talmudic Sanhedrin 9799 or is the basis of Sanhedrin 9799 the Talmud was actually written a lot later it includes stuff that goes back to the first century that people remembered orally and finally committed to writing so it's kind of like well how much of the Talmud is actually reflecting stuff Christ taught and by contrast you could say well how much of what was taught when Christ was alive as the meaning of scripture Christ is saying and it goes into the Talmud because it was true in scripture before Christ said it now the trouble with that is that what Christ is doing here with this timeline is he's taking the sum of time from the year he talks which in the Bible's terms is 4136 from Adam's fall. If you did your begats, starting in Genesis 5, and you did the math right, knowing that they were solar years, and you counted all the begats, and you kept on following the generations that the Bible tells you, going from Adam's fall, it's actually his fall, not his birth, from Adam to Christ, you would come up with a proper total of 4136 for this date in this year when Christ dies and that's what I did there's a worksheet called genius.xls it's in here you know one of the links is in here and it shows you how the time is and you can check your Bible with the times that are given and see oh Brain out got this from the Bible. Yeah, I didn't get it from a scholar. I went straight to scripture. Because the scholars can't add and subtract. I'm sorry. And it doesn't matter what denomination they are. They're equally bad. Okay, even my own pastor didn't get it right. Because he's listening to what other pastors said. And he didn't go back and do the actual calendar from the very beginning. Okay, it's one of the few things I can find out that he got wrong. But he suspected this 490 as early as 1977 when he was teaching. But I never heard him actually, you know, develop it. And it's because of his suspicion, and I'm thinking it's because he died, that I get this because this whole structure of 490 plus 70 490 actually validates everything I can find, everything else that he taught and corrects the few things he got wrong. Which is, you know, if you're God and, and you appointed somebody to be a pastor, it's, the pastor himself, after he dies, is going to want whatever he got wrong corrected. So I think that's why I got it. And it's so simple, even a brain out can calculate it, but it's tedious and it's time consuming. That's the difference. And the scholars won't spend the time. So they didn't even bother to count the syllables. If they counted the syllables, they're going to see what you see right up here. Just count the syllables. You, you you go by clause. You, you first parse the Greek into the clauses. And then you count the syllables in the clauses. And the only problem is, is, is this pronounced with two syllables or one? Hieru. 
and in some cases it's two syllables and in some cases it's one syllable but Matthew's writing it and in Matthew chapter 1 he elides structures like this in the one syllable so I know okay in Matthew 25 I gotta do the same thing Matthew 24 I gotta do the same thing Paul doesn't do that alright Luke doesn't do that Mark doesn't do that but Matthew did and that's like you know a, a dialect you know if you're in the south you talk if you're in the south you talk certain way okay so he's using a dialectical pronunciation well that's easy enough to tell because the syllable counts tell you what he's trying to aim at okay and they all integrate and they all make sense so now the big goal is now that you know the syllable counts how do the syllable counts relate to the text well here we got our next big clue how apocrites amen blepo all those things form a sentence in order in verse order here we're in the notes section they form a sentence so you don't even have to look yet at the text just first look at the outline this is the outline of the two chapters together see first word first key word is Jesus second key word apocrites third key word amen fourth key word blepo fifth key word semion sixth key word parousia and then he starts it over you don't even see the word kurios until later the first time the word kurios appears is right here at verse 42 so it's Jesus prior the second synonym for him doesn't appear I mean you could say parousia because it's parousia to huyo to anthropo and he's the son of man that's the name he used for himself the most so you say well that's a synonym okay but that's also a phrase that's a true anaphora versus just a keyword all right so you say oh well parousia second all right and then kurias comes much later and then it's repeated over and over and over again in the last half all right because it's starting at the end of matthew 25 4 and then it starts being repeated more and more often in Matthew 25. Well, the end of Matthew 24 is 1673 A.D. So after the Reformation, just the start, the first time Kurios is used is right here in verse 42. See how the navigation took me there? This, as I've already explained, is talking about Wycliffe and Huss. So the very first time Kurios, Lord, is used is for the reformers teaching his word, for the reformers finding his word, for the reformers translating his word in contradistinction to the Catholic Church. Now, if you're Catholic, don't get all nervous, okay? Every single denomination every single sect every single teacher as I started to say what about even my own pastor gets part of it wrong that's not the point the point is is the Bible free for you to look at instead of being chained up by somebody and in these days the Catholic Church was guilty of chaining up the Bible now any kind of guilt is not solely a hundred percent guilt the reason it chained up the Bible is people didn't want to know. The reason it chained up the Bible is that to make a copy of the Bible took 10 months of daily scribal writing it out. So it was expensive, it was hard, and they didn't want it stolen. But they came to become, what do you want to call it, greedy and jealous of their having the word, but everybody else didn't. And they didn't want to surrender it so that it could be free to be taught. And that's a wrong thing. That wasn't the problem in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, everybody had scripture. There was no pope ever in the Old Testament. There was no papacy in the Old Testament. There was no hierarchical system 
in the Old Testament. You had basically the Sanhedrin, which were a bunch of judges, and yeah, they also happened to be, ideally, they also happened to be rabbis. But every single area in Israel, you know, within, I don't know, every mile or so, there was a, there was a, a synagogue. And the teacher of that synagogue was teaching all the people within the mile. That was his territory. And there was nobody who had authority over him. All right? And they would each have a copy of, the, of the, their version of the Bible, which in those days was the varying parts of the Old Testament, in their own local synagogue, local church, local synagogue. And he had his authority over his own flock not over somebody else's flock. And Paul is real adamant about that in his letters to Timothy. There, there's no justification whatsoever for a papacy, period, over and out. But you can elect whoever you want to be your teacher. You can elect whoever you want to tell you what the Bible says. Okay, but once you do that, that's you doing that, not them doing it to you. So when in history it happens, okay, and that's what had been going on until this point. When in history it happens that a bunch of Bible teachers decide, well, we start to have authority over you, that's wrong. Okay? It's just flat wrong. The pastor's job is to teach Bible. And what you do with it is your sovereign right before God. And that was always true in the Old Testament. And it should have remained true under church. It did not. So now the Bible has to be freed up from ecclesiastical control. And that's what the Curios reference in particular does. So now we go back again to the notes to see the flow of history that the notes unveils. So we start out in verse order, 30 AD, Christ. He's on earth and he's talking here. So, Jesus... Christ, Apocrites, gives a ruling, and his ruling begins with the words Amen, Lego, Humin, and that is a judgment, specifically a judgment that's going to be characterized by religious war. He's not causing the war, he's letting it happen, and that's the judgment, is he lets it happen. Okay, and why that matters to us particularly right now is that same Amen is going to come up during our time, which is right here. See? That's our time right now, through 2023. This is 2017. And the next Amen is coming up in 2030. 2000th anniversary of Christ's death is when it begins. Do you begin to see that this is timed and on purpose? I was so shocked when I started doing this. I kept saying, oh, no, 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 what can this be? And, you know, now I'm finally accepting it. So I don't expect you to believe me. In fact, I don't even want you to. I want you to vet this for yourself. So we go back to the notes where these keywords are now reordered in verse order rather than alphabetical order. All right? So Jesus rules a judgment that's characterized by religious war every single time that phrase occurs I'm in Lego Humi and I've already done you know I already showed you in the second part of this navigation set of videos how you know how you can prove that see you just go to the verse okay and that's the verse now you go to its note and oh wow well, see the first time it was First of all, it's marking the actual text, is marking the temple. See, because it's starting as a result of the temple going down. And that's where we saw Titus dying. All right, but the actual text is referring back to the temple. So he's got, he's got, he's doing a parallel set of timelines here. The temple actually goes down in 70 AD, which is marked here. Okay, but there are aftermath, there are effects. There are repetitions of history that's going to occur. And in Daniel 9, we knew that when the seven years before the, the millennium was to begin, that's what the 63 signifies, 
that the temple was supposed to go down. All right. So the question everybody had on his mind when Christ is talking 63 years before the millennium was due to start is, well, if the temple's going to go down, then are you coming back? And that's what they ask here. And what are the signs of your coming? You see? So it all interacts, and at the same time, it's giving you parallel timelines of future events that have a similar quality to them as the text is depicting without reference to the timeline. All right? So, back to notes. Let's look at that timeline. Jesus rules judgment. That's your sentence. And it is a sentence on mankind. Mankind has to be periodically cleaned in order to free him up from religion. Jesus answers with the ruling of judgment. Now what's the judgment? Well, that'll be in the text after each Amen, and it's always some kind of religious war that occurs because we have three instances, four and in three instances already, and each time religious war was occurring. Temple down, the Crusades, and the Reformation are three prior. And then upcoming for us right here in 2030 is another Amen. So it's got to be some kind of judgment. It's got to be public. It's got to take some form of religious war. And that's not too hard to, to understand how it could do that in these days. Okay, we're on the verge of war right now. Take your pick where. Are we going to war with North Korea? Trump would like that a whole bunch. Putin would like that a whole bunch. China would like that a whole bunch. North Korea is a, a, a snare to China. China is just an expense to China. The only reason North Korea stays alive is due to Chinese aid. So what if Putin and China decide to say, okay, let's shake hands, we'll divide up North Korea amongst ourselves so they can't be so stupid anymore. And that way we'll make friends with America too because we all got our own stuff we need to handle internally and we don't really want to fight with each other so let's just sacrifice North Korea to do that. That could happen tomorrow. They're already making noises like that and North Korea must be aware of it because that's why they're trying to test their own nuclear weapons. And maybe China's helping them to do that because China knows doggone well the world isn't going to permit it and then they just partition North Korea and Russia takes the part that that's abutting Russia and China takes the part that's next to China and done. And America just sits there and nods its head and says yeah. And then South Korea doesn't need any troops and then put Trump can pull the troops out of South Korea and say what a good president he is. See, that's that's a realistic scenario about North Korea. It's just a it's just a pawn. Always has been. Okay, but now the circumstances are right for it to go. All right. So where do you want your war? And of course, you know, Middle East is always potential. All right. So I'm in judgment. So we have a sentence. Jesus answering says judgment. Now what's the judgment? Well, the content's going to basically be some kind of religious war. And what if that's the judgment that happens? What are you doing? Blepo, paying attention. Horao, seeing it. And then what is that judgment? Samayan, it's a sign. So Jesus answering says, judgment, see. Pay attention. See the sign. And what is that? Of his coming. Because if a judgment is coming from God, that's a type of coming. See, parousia literally means to appear, and it has a, a sort of cultural significance in Greek of the second coming of Christ, but God comes to you in many ways. God comes to you through his word. God comes to you through something that happens in your life privately that makes you aware of him. God comes to a nation or, an, or a region through all kinds of different ways. Prosperity is what we fail to recognize the most. What we recognize the most is the sign, and this is always a negative word, of something bad happening. Earthquake, disaster. Why did God let this happen to me? Everybody says. Well, but that's an appearance. 
and we know it's an, that's the proper word for it because we first start thinking about God, His coming, coming to judge in this case. All right, and so since we got Jesus answering a judgment, pay attention, look at the sign of His coming and ruling, making a ruling. See it again. See, so we got our first ruling here, and then we, we had complete the sentence. Jesus, Jesus, why is it doing that? Jesus answers and rules, judgment, pay attention, look at the sign of his coming. That's a whole sentence right there. Another ruling, pay attention, look at Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of making judgments? What's the purpose of making rulings? So that you will pay attention and look at Jesus Christ. Notice this is all in verse order. So if you were a Greek reader at the time that this book was published, which was 30 AD, okay, the Jews might, might call, I mean the Jews at the time might call it 33. Because they had their own BCAD accounting, but that that's too complicated to explain why they would call it 33. All right, it has to do with a guy named Varro and another guy named Livy at that time. But see, they would be looking, they would be tracking the scripture by these keywords, and as you can see, it's intended to be tracked by keywords because it forms a complete sentence each time. Jesus answering with the ruling. Believe it when I tell you. And then here's the judgment. So pay attention. See the sign of his coming. And he gives another ruling. Pay attention. See Jesus Christ. So there's your second sentence. And each one of them has a ruling starting it. Here Jesus is the first word. Here Jesus is the object. And then it's repeated again. Pay attention. See Christ. And then Christ the sign of his coming. The sign of his coming. You see how it's, it's in pairs? Repeated. This is obviously deliberate. These word orders. You see how they make sentences? Okay. In Greek the word order can vary and, this, and the meaning would be the same. But they do follow a, a word order often, like we do. Subject, verb, object. I mean, that's pretty common in most languages. They don't have to follow it in a language like Greek, but they often do. Alright, so look. Jesus, we'll do it again. Jesus answering with the ruling of judgment. Pay attention. See the sign of his coming. Ruling. Pay attention. See Jesus Christ, which is the whole purpose of a sign. Pay attention. See Christ. See, in the, Jesus isn't repeated, but Christ is. Because that's his official title, Anointed One. Alright? And then, he's the sign of his coming. Sign of his coming. Pay attention. See the sign of his coming or his coming. Pay attention. See the judgment. Judgment is a sign of his coming. Coming of the Lord. First time the Lord is used. And that's the Reformation when it really begins in 1402. He's coming. See, if there's a Reformation that frees up Bible. That's him coming. That's the Lord coming. And you know why it's the Lord coming? Because you're getting the Bible, which is his word. Because somebody is being hired by him to teach it. Somebody's being hired by him to translate it. And when he does, and when that word comes to you, that's him coming to you. That's him appearing inside your soul to show you, Hi, I'm the Lord. The Lord appearing the Lord. 
you know, because he's God man, so it's got to be repeated twice, even though Kurios technically means the deity part of, you know, deity nature. You got two arms and two legs, okay? So he's God and man. It's like that. It's real simple. I don't know why the the Catholics got so confused about that in the first five centuries or ten centuries of this, you know, post cross. Oh, is he one well or two wells or one person or two persons? Honey, you got two arms and two legs. It works the same way. I can put one arm behind my back and not use it. So when he was down here, he didn't use his deity, except when Father told him to. That would be harder. It's harder to put to, to do everything with one arm behind your back. There's two natures and one body. That's not hard to understand. You're not using one of your arms. He didn't look into his deity. He waited for the Holy Spirit to give him whatever the information was. But that's like walking around with your arm that with your arm behind your back and you're putting your arm behind your back. You're not tying it there. You're just holding it there. You're holding your arm behind your back so that you won't use it. And then you do everything with your other arm. That makes life a lot harder. So it's harder to be God man than it is to be just man or just God. You get that? He added humanity to himself. That's what Philippians 2 through 2, 5 through 10 tells you. Well, I don't know what, what, did the, the so-called Catholics not understand all that? Okay? It's real easy to understand God, man. And he's one person. You have two arms and two legs, but you're still one person. Your arms and your legs aren't a different person. Duh. Godness and humanness aren't, aren't separate persons. They're separate natures. Duh. Okay, so the Lord appears. The Lord judges. And this judgment is the Reformation. The actual official Reformation, specifically the English Reformation, not Luther's. Luther started in 1517, the English Reformation started in 1570, and 1570 is using 490 plus 490 plus 490, 1570 was the 490, I mean the 70 year period, so you got 1050, alright, and then the next 490, that takes you to uh, 1540, alright, which is 1570 A.D., 1540 years after the cross. So now you got the 70-year voting period when everybody gets to vote on whether they want to learn God. That's what the Reformation really was. This should be obvious. In England in particular, they had to vote on whether they were going to go along with everybody in the papacy or they were going to go along with everybody in Calvin's Geneva or they were going to go out on their own direction. Well, they went out on their own direction. And that is what you're supposed to do. That's what it was when Christ was here. So we have a return right here through this judgment of the English Reformation. We have a return to the idea that was true in Christ's day. Hi, you learn the Bible on your own. There's no Pope, there's no King to tell you how to learn it. Now they didn't get it 100% right because they still decided, well, the King is the head of the church. Well, the only reason they did that is because they didn't want the church politicizing to overthrow the king. Other than that, they wanted to keep their hands off. Okay, well, better that they didn't even need to have the king be the head of the church, but at least it's less, he's not trying to tell the church what to do. He's just trying to stop the church from telling him what to do. Okay. Well, that was a big advance versus what was going on in the European continent and elsewhere in the world. All right, so judgment. All right, so look. The appearance of the Lord. Appearance of the Lord. Again, twice. Judgment. Now we have our next occurrence of Amen. Judgment of the Lord. Or judgment for the Lord to be the husband. See, judgment, Lord, and now we got a new keyword husband 
bridegroom, literally, gives a ruling. The bridegroom is the Lord giving a ruling of judgment. And that is our time right here. So then the question is, well, what kind of ruling is it? Well, then you have to get into what does the text say? And in order to establish context, in order to know what time it is, in specific events so that you can understand what this text means that's where the meter comes in this is 1998 and the door got closed closed on what closed against the foolish virgins and when did the foolish virgins start well the foolish virgins start here okay this is World War I. This is World War II. The syllable counts exactly match. Oh. And then, this is when the foolish virgins are leaving. They're leaving. Going away. And while, see this in the Greek means while they're going away exit stage left to buy oil they think you can buy it the bridegroom comes and as I said in my 42nd video of this series how could they not hear the bridegroom come it was pretty loud coming okay the word bridegroom here at the end it's standing for 1946, plus 30 equals 1976. You know what happened in 1976? Major find, again, third time, of Codex Aleph, which is pretty much universally recognized as our most valuable Bible manuscript, coming from St. Catherine's Monastery. There were many copies made that were housed there, and they were gradually found back in the 1800s. Every time you see Numphias here, Oh, go back to the verse. Go back to the verse. Every time you see Numphias, from the first time it's used onward, it stands for something found at St. Catherine's Monastery called Codex Aleph. It means Bible copy. It's more there was more than one copy. And that's our tends to be our most reliable manuscript because it's so early and it's so complete. All right, and it was found again. Another portion was found in 1976. That's a pretty loud occurrence. That was in the news. Yadi yadi would have been much louder in the news of pastors. Okay, well, all these pastors had gone away to buy. That's what the Greek says there. We're in the process of leaving in the process of leaving. They hadn't actually finished leaving. They were in the process of going away. Well, where were they going away to? Politics. This is 1960 when uh, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and all those other bastards rise up in politics. God isn't good enough for them. Oh, they need to be political. So they're going away from the bridegroom. So the bridegroom comes through his word, Codex Aleph, and through, there was a lot, there was a bunch, my pastor happened to be just one of them, there were a bunch of Bible teachers at that time who were really learning these words, and really teaching these words. That's how I learned to read the Greek. And in fact, in my particular case, 1976, was when I discovered this guy. Well, it was actually 1971, but see, it's the, the actual text is starting before 76. Ho Okay, 76, 75, 74. I was discovering the, that teacher during that time. I was in college. I had first heard of him my freshman year in 1972, 71. But I didn't get serious about it until and I had no idea about this that but that pastor was teaching in this Greek all right 
and at the same time Codex Aleph was being found. I couldn't even spell Jesus in those days. Alright? There are a lot of people like me. Okay? You can t talk to people who are my age. Talk to people in their 60s. Who are, who are, you know, somewhat cognizant of Bible. And they'll tell you their stories. This was a very common thing to happen. They called it Jesus Movement. The Jesus Freaks. We were going on in campuses all over the United States. Okay? But there was also a politicizing because it was so popular to start to believe in Christ again. So you have a polarization of the foolish virgins leaving and the wise ones who are still there. So Christ shut up the wise ones with him between 1976 and 1998. And by that point you either went with the apostates who were forming their political junk here or you got serious about scripture and you closed the door on politics no politics no popes no kings just him I just want to learn him yeah because he closed the door which is another way of saying he's protecting you so by 1998 this polarization between apostates and people learning Christ pretty much completed and then that's all you hear. And later on, come back. They're called the remaining ones because the wise ones are shut up. The loud, the loud, the loud, foolish virgins. They're the remainder because the ones who are with God are already shut up with God behind the door. And they're loud and saying, Trump, Trump, open to us. Busy saying, all over YouTube, all in those, those right-wing TV stations and, and, and blog posts and radio channels. Oh, Trump is the Savior. Trump is the Savior. Yeah, Lord, Lord. It's on your TV every day. It's not too hard for me to understand what this is talking about, and nor should it be too hard for you. 2015, 2016. Trump, Trump is the Lord, Trump is the Lord, Trump is the Lord, and open to us, yeah, put us in government, give us everything that we want, we want a wall, we want the black, the non-whites out, we want all this kind of stupid stuff that's totally anti-Christ, give it to us. So their Lord is not the Lord. So what has to happen? A ruling. Apocrites. Believe it when I tell you, I don't know you, you foolish Christians who are politicizing making Trump Lord. And what is that going to have to mean when it's 50% of Christians in the United States? It has to have some kind of effect like the reformation of a re religious war. Now is it going to mean military and violence and all that good? I'd like to think it was just going to be debate and there's going to be some kind of important find it might be already going on this also signifies yet another big find of scripture just like it did here or Courier is more about reformers teaching scripture Numphias was about the actual finding of it so the finds Maybe something in all the finds of scripture, some special teaching suddenly starts to appear that's kind of like revolutionary, and I'm thinking it's the meter. I can't be the only one to know about this now. I've been documenting it for 15 years. The meter has been known by scholars to exist since the Reformation. I documented that in an earlier video showing you books that were already published as early as John Knox's own meter about um, the Old Testament. They know the meter exists. What they don't know is how it's constructed. They don't know about the 70 because they don't count the syllables. Well, don't you think somebody, if I've been documenting this for 15 years, am I the only one who discovered it 15 years ago? I doubt it. I might be the most prolific at this point, 
mostly because I don't know I have to report what I find when I find it but by 2018 oh maybe some scholar with a lot of initials after his name that people respect says oh well by accident I came across this stupid brain out person but then I checked the scripture myself and oh yes it is metered in sevens yeah no kidding I don't matter the meter matters and why should anybody listen to me well they'll listen maybe to some scholar maybe God's hiring some scholar now or maybe it's something else about Bible teaching and Bible translation that's just revolutionary that's going to occur and is occurring since 2015 the reason I say it's the meter is that that Anoni Nominon discovered this Matthew meter in 2015 and he kept telling me to look at it and he kept telling me the, the sort of like gist of what I'm telling you now and I wouldn't listen to him I'm a putz okay so now we go back and we see oh wow this this these notes and the meter order make sentences Jesus judges Jesus rule gives a ruling and there's going to be judgment that takes place like religious war pay attention see the sign of his coming through his word here's a ruling again pay attention see Jesus Christ himself through his word pay attention see Christ through his word he's the sign this is the sign of his coming when his word comes to you the sign of his coming when the word comes to you pay attention see the coming pay attention see the judgment is his coming too and that means he's the Lord that means he's appearing because he's the Lord is judgment which is coming at the Reformation the Lord those are you know that now the, this is when Curiosus starts to be used it actually started here for his what do you want to call it slaves teaching the word translating the word showing the word and then we got well because he's the bridegroom and the bridegroom's words are being discovered mostly at St. Catherine's Monastery, but really elsewhere. There was a whole slew of Bible manuscripts that were discovered during the 19th century. But that was the most important one, so he's highlighting that. Alright? Each of these three times. Each of these three times. St. Catherine's Monastery called Exalab. And I'm sure there were others also. But see, this tells you how to interpret interpret the text this is what the wise virgins wanted the word their bridegroom is really the Lord so he's giving a ruling as bridegroom and as the Lord and the ruling is ignored by the foolish virgins who instead say Lord Lord anointed one Christ means anointed one to Trump it's all over the internet just type in Trump anointed in Google just type it in YouTube see it for yourself in their own words so what has to be the ruling of the real Lord it has to be judgment which is coming up to us starting in the 2000th anniversary of the real Lord's death. Now, you'll notice I boxed this section. I boxed it because there are 70 occurrences of all these keywords. And so what's in the middle, the middle of them is the nest is the center is like nested Russian dolls the center of history starts right here at the Reformation which makes sense and the trouble is that same center it's not the end of history it's the end of the center ends with us in 2030 well, actually 2036 see we have an Amen as a bookend the center of Amen, remember? 
you're looking for the centers. You're always looking for the centers. The center of Amen is one, two. Okay, so this is our center. This is our center. Then one, two. Oh, so the center is from the Reformation until 2036. Yep. So I boxed it. We are still in the center of history from which everything sort of like amalgamates and congregates like setting up a perfect storm. And everything that comes after this center in history between the Reformation and now, span of about a little over 500 years, all the rest of history is going to be determined by what's happening now. Our now started at the English Reformation and ends about 2036, 2041, depending on how you want to interpret Amen, because the content of Amen ends at 2041. So you see why it's not far-fetched to say, oh boy, whatever's going on with Trump is evil incarnate. Whatever's going on with Trump is going to cause a huge war and judgment. Heck, you didn't have to know the Bible meter to know that. All you have to do is read the news. Okay, but doesn't it help to know that Christ predicted this back in 30 AD? There you are. And if I want the full end of the center, that's the center of history. That's where we are right now. We are at the end of a center of history that's forecast since 30 AD. And the center portion of it started at the English Reformation and it ends with us. And it may be the end of us. And what is so interesting about this and kind of scary is my pastor right here at the door that's 1998 at the very end the last sentence of Tura Tura means door that's when he started going around the country he was still well then he got sick afterwards as soon as his job was done he gets sick he traveled around the country and he was really popular in those days and he would go to to like five or six or seven different places around the country every year and he would give you know he would have like a little three-day four-day teaching session of what he was teaching currently back in Houston alright and in 1998 what he did is he traveled the country going to the different places and he would always give the same three-day speech hi America is too apostate owing to these politicizing Christians. And he speculated that 40 years from 1998, the U.S. might not exist anymore. In other words, it might be taken over by a foreign power. Okay, so what is that? Nineteen ninety-eight plus 40 is 2038. And what is the scripture saying here? 2036, possibly 2041. He did not know this meter. The doctrines behind it he knew and taught, so did many other pastors. But that's pretty that's pretty chilling, don't you think? That here is a student under this guy who was a student for 40 years at that point now being told by somebody else who is also a student under the same guy hey take a look at this this is a timing prophecy of the future for church and I'm like nah can't predict the rapture well it's not about predicting the rapture it's about telling you what your time is going to be like if there's no rapture you'd still have to know that wouldn't you you have to know when Christmas is coming. You have to know when it's Martin Luther King Day. Well, you have to know the, the output of history in advance so you can orient to it. That's why we have a Bible. It's not strictly about the rapture. Besides, when the rapture comes, you don't really need to prepare for it other than to learn Bible because you don't know when you're going to die anyway. But how can you prepare for the rapture? And besides, once it happens, you're no longer on earth. That's not the kind of preparation you need. 
what you need is preparation in earth because you're still here. What you need is preparation on earth because you're going to die. So you see, the rapture is not something to drool over. The rapture is just something to be aware of, like you have to be aware of. You could die tomorrow. So, what's the lesson? Get ready. Yeah, but you want to do that anyway because, honey, you got to clean the dishes and Johnny needs a haircut and golly if I could just use Bible doctrine to make it more enjoyable to do those things yeah that's what it's there for meanwhile it gets pretty sophisticated hi you think you're just washing the dishes and giving Johnny a haircut but I'm making you the center of history your daily decisions and your use of doctrine while you do those stupid things I'm using to determine history because you're salt of the earth because when you think what you think while you do what you do, I hear that. I'm God. And if it pleases me, I bless the world. And if it doesn't please me, I curse the world. Now, where do you want to be in that? I'm in. Believe it when I tell you, you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. I'm in. This is going to be a bad side of it because too many Christians don't want to think properly before me. They want a different Lord. They want Trump. Well, I don't. I'm the real God. He's not. Believe it when I tell you judgment is coming on them. Do you want to be judged or do you want to be joyous? Take your pick. Center of history. From English Reformation, it was the same issue. Only now, everybody's got the Bible. It's free on the Internet. I can learn the Greek and Hebrew without paying a dime. Well, for my computer, and maybe sometimes for software, but I don't actually have to do that. Just the internet is good. Just use Bible Gateway and you'll learn, because all that stuff's for free there. Oh! Okay, so what excuse are you going to have if you don't do it? Huh? Okay, and the rest of history is therefore the appearance of the Lord, the Lord, see, pay attention, see the Lord see how now it's all piling up see pay attention the Lord see it's repeated three times now he's his coming parousia this is the second time parousia is used after the center the Lord pay attention see he's ruling the Lord da 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 see the repetition his appearance as king his ruling the Lord, pay attention, see his ruling as king. And then another religious war. His ruling, the Lord's, see, pay attention, see his ruling. And then the final religious war. See, you got a whole press that's right there in front of your face in what looks like a sort of a serving bowl. You know this whole this whole thing. Doesn't that look like a serving bowl to you? With the with the here's the the first two lines are the top of it, and then the rest is like one of those shallow serving bowls of pasta. Here's your pasta. The outline of history right there, in black and red. Isn't that cute? That's how the Greeks would be reading this. They would be going by the keywords. The keywords are like little bookends, as you can see why they would be. That's how the Old Testament is worded, too. I first learned this when I was looking at Isaiah 53 back in 2008 when I first learned the meter existed. He does everything as bookends. Just Google on Isaiah, ISA 53 map, capital M, AP, dot PDF or JPG. See the map of Isaiah. He's doing the same thing and his keywords fit the maps of the meters and the meters are mapped too. Okay? So, you use the notes in order to see the verse order and the sentences being repeated and created and they're full sentences. They make total sense. They're repetitive but history repeats itself. What can I tell you? And then you look at these individual meters and you say, okay, well, how does 63 relate to Amen Legohumi? Okay, well, 
63. Go look it up. What's 63 years from? 30 AD when Christ talks? Well, that's 94 AD. And what was 94 AD? Well, that's 4,200 years from when Adam fell. That was when the millennium was supposed to start, per Psalm 90. And then you begin to say, oh, well, then this 63 would be meaningful to somebody reading it at the time who knew the meter. Yeah. And then the text is associated with that meter. And what does 63 always mean? Starting in Isaiah, most notably. But actually, it started with, with Moses in Genesis 1. The very first meter of the Bible is in Genesis 1. And the very first meter of the Bible is 63. What did that stand for? 63 sevens. What did that stand for? The amount of time Israel was enslaved. Oh, well then Genesis 1 isn't really about how long and old the earth is. That's right. It's about slavery into freedom. And he's setting up a water analogy about the earth being enslaved underwater that the geologists call Pangaea. And you don't know how long ago that was. And it doesn't matter how long ago that was. What matters is it happened. You were, there were, we were drowning in our ignorance. And we got saved into his cognizance. And that's happening on a daily basis. So you get washed with the water of the word. Or you get drowned with the water of stupidity. Take your pick. So what are you doing then? You're voting. And what is that? Oh, that's 63. And what is that? Oh, well, let's look at meter meaning. 63, 63, vote short. There's seven years, bad years, tribulation. It didn't get made up. Yeah, it didn't get made up. So it's going to be nasty the last seven years because 70 is a total voting period. Now, I'm sure that your eyes are glazing over. I know mine are. But hopefully you understand that all this stuff is really concise and really precise and really unknown and yet really preserved by some monks who had sweat in their eyes who had candle wax and maybe a little too much beer copying and copying and copying and never understanding the doctrine so make good on their labor learn it yourself